So let's start off with the definition. Continuity. So we'll go with continuity at a point first. <coughs> Actually, in order to do this, so this would be at an interior point. So I need to find interior point and a left end point and a right end point. So that's the definition we need to start with. So if I'll give the math definition first. Uh, X naught is an interior point of f of x if there exists an open interval a, b that is a subset of the domain of f such that x naught is inside this interval a, b. So that's what it means to be an interior point. So this is the math definition. You probably want one that's more intuitive. But is that ABC? So A, B, and A. A subset. So I don't think I talked about subsets in this class. Uh, so that's a pre-calculus one concept. So I'll really quickly talk about subset. It looks like a C, except it's it doesn't, the C sort of looks like the... Like a sideways U. Yeah, sideways U. The, uh, a C, I would curve in the ends like, like a horseshoe, like that. All right, so this symbol is subset. So definition of subset. So we're given two sets, A and B. A is a subset of B, means any element of A implies it also lives inside of B. So everything inside A, also inside B. If you like the uh, Venn diagram type of uh, descriptions, basically it means this right here. So A is inside B. So everything in A is also in B. I think when you use the word Venn diagram, is the two circles intersecting. Um, I don't know what that notation is called, but I think you understand what I mean here. All right, so that's subset. All right, so it's a nice intuitive definition. So the intuitive concept. So the x values close to x naught are also in the domain of f of x. And then we have left endpoint and right endpoint. So x naught is a left endpoint if if there exists an interval x naught comma b and it's open on the b side that is inside the domain of f. And any interval uh, 
And we can write this a little more precisely. I'll use the letter delta. for small positive values of delta. All right, so what in the world am I talking about here? Let's do number lines. Those are good ways to think about intervals. Now there's also right endpoint, but this definition is not very intuitive. So let's just draw out a, let's do an example. So let's suppose domain of F is, let's do zero to four, and we'll go close at four union, five to infinity. So on a number line, we got zero, we want to include four, don't include five, and go all the way to infinity. So we'll look at interior points first. So any x between 0 and 4, where will that x live? Even if it's really close to 4, it's never going to equal 4 if it's in that open interval. So even if I pick an x that's super close to 4, 3.9999 with a lot of 9s afterwards, no matter how close you get to 4, I will be able to go and pick a really small open interval that will still land inside that interval right there. So even if you choose 3.99999, I will go and say, oh, well, there's a tiny little space here, so I'll just choose a really, maybe I'll choose half that distance and make an open interval. So any x between 0 and 4 is an interior point. Now it's a little tricky. If you're, what about close to 0? So let's say you're really close to 0. Well, you can't equal 0. So no matter what x value you choose, there'll be a little distance between your x value and 0. So the idea is there's no smallest number. No matter what number you're thinking of, I could just cut it in half, and I'll have a number closer to 0. So if you think, oh, what about you know, 0 0.00000001, well, I'll just cut that in half, and I got a number smaller that's still inside the uh, interval. And then I'll just take a small open interval, and that will live inside our domain right there. So these are interior points. I could do the same thing over here. Anything that's bigger than 5 and less than infinity is also an interior point. So any x between 0 and 4 and between 5 and infinity are interior points. There is, in this case, there's only one uh, boundary point or one endpoint. What x value do you think it is? So it'll be 4. So 4 is on the boundary. Now, this will be called a right endpoint. So 4 is going to be a right endpoint because it's on the, it's the rightmost point in that interval. So 4 will be actually on the boundary of the interval. 
So why is there no boundary point at 0? Well, x equals 0, is that inside the interval? Yeah. Nope. So it's, not a, it's neither a boundary uh, point or an interior point. It's not in the domain at all. So 0 is out. You can't use 5 either. So 0 and 5 would be boundary points, but they're not actually included. So I get no boundary points at 0, no boundary point at 5. Does that make sense? So x equals 0, x equals 5 are not, not in the domain. So not in the domain of f. So they are not, they would be left endpoints, but they're not in the domain, so they're not left endpoints. Infinity is not a number, so infinity is not a right endpoint. And you get infinity. Right. Yeah, so there's no, there's no biggest value right there. Uh, until you go to graduate school and learn about completing uh, the real numbers. But we won't be doing that. The compactification of the real number line, fun stuff, but we won't be doing that here. All right, so that should give you some intuition on a right endpoint. So I'll just draw you a picture of a left endpoint. How about that? So that was a, oh, was a left endpoint and a right endpoint. It'll be that value right there. Uh oh. That's a left endpoint. So it'll be this x value. So we got one right endpoint in this example right here. So if zero was included though, as a square bracket, we would count zero and That would be a left endpoint, yeah. Or I can just change it around like this. Um, so now x equals five is a left endpoint now that I changed the problem. Now it's a little strange because four is to the left of five, but five's a right, five's a left endpoint, four is a right endpoint. It's with respect to the interval it's in. So you want to think about four, don't look at five, just think about this interval right here. So x equals four is the end, the right end of the interval. If I just look at this interval, x equals five is at the left end of that interval. So that's the left endpoint. And then every other point, is called interior. Let's say you were like approaching four from the positive side, would five be your interior endpoint? So four and five are far apart. Right. So they're not. But you can't approach four from the positive side. Correct. So it would be five, right? Would be your endpoint? So for this function f, it would not make sense to have a limit approaching four from the right side because there's no, I can't talk about y values on the right, there are no y values on the right side. I could have a left limit approaching 4 because all those x values are in the domain. Okay. So I can't do a limit going this way, nor could I look at a, a left limit of 5 because there's no y values to the left of 5. So that, that would be out also. So what we're going to get is we're going to get a definition of continuity at an interior point and then you could be left or right continuous depending on if you're on the boundary. So we'll do continuity at a point first. And if you want the full definitions, I believe your book is formal definitions for every single term that I define. So if you want the full math definition, you can look in your textbook. And that's a good, 
a good math definition. It may not be very useful for you because it will look pretty similar to what I wrote down here. So it'll say there exists some interval as these properties, and then therefore it's a um, left endpoint, right endpoint, etc. So we'll go with continuity at a point. So continuity of point, uh, x naught domain of f. So let's say if x naught is an interior point, f of x is continuous at x naught. Actually, I don't want the word. So we'll suppose x is interior. f of x is continuous at x naught if limit x approaches x naught f of x equals f of x naught. So here is where our limit, if our limit matches the value, we're continuous. Of course, the limit, so an equivalent condition, lim x approaches x naught from the left equals lim x approaches x naught from the right equals f of x naught. So we saw in the one-sided limits that if your two left and right limit agree, then your limit exists, and it's that value. So if your limits agree and you're equal to the value, you're continuous. So either way, you could summarize this and say if, if left and right limits agree and are equal to the y value. So that's a nice way to summarize that. So you've got to match up three things, left limit, right limit, and value. All have to match up. And then you can say we're continuous at that interior point. All right, so that was for an interior right there. Next up, not every point's interior. So let's think about, we'll go left. Yeah, we'll do left continuous. So if x naught is a left endpoint, we can draw out a nice little picture right here. x naught, I don't really care what the right end of that uh, interval is, but x naught is a left endpoint. What is the only limit that makes sense to take? Doesn't make sense to take this limit. X approaches X naught. What side can I take this limit on? Can I do a left limit or a right limit? So it's a little strange. We have a left endpoint, but we can only go with a right limit. So that's a little bit strange. So the limit that makes sense to take is one going to the right, not one going to the left. If I go to, from the left side, that's bad. There's no. Uh, x values over there that I can use. So you don't get a left limit, so x naught from the positive side. So if that equals f of x naught, then f is, we would say, r right continuous. Continuous is a hard word to write, so we'll just use CTS. Too many vowels in continuous. So over here I'll write 
CTS means continuous. Can't even spell this word. So IOUS, something like that. So there's no, the second I shouldn't be there. All right, continue us. So X now is the right endpoint this time. So our interval will look like this. So of course over here, it only makes sense to take a limit from one direction, which is from negative land or from the left side. If lim x approaches x naught from the negative side, so if that one side limit matches the value, then f is left continuous. I should say at x equals x naught. At x not, x x not. Oy. All right. So these are continuous at a point, and if you're a boundary point. You can only talk about being continuous on the inside side. So what about not at a point? What about at an interval? So a function f of x is CTS on the interval AB, which better be inside the domain. You don't want to talk about x values not in the domain. That wouldn't make any sense. So function continuous on a, b in the domain of f, if f is continuous for all x in the interval a, b. So if x is continuous for all the x's in between a and b, then you're continuous on the interval. So that's what it means to be continuous on interval. So what if it's closed on one side? Well, let's do closed on both sides. And then I will just say et cetera, et cetera, if it's closed on just one side. So again, this AB interval better be in the domain of F. So if F is continuous, for all x in the open interval a, b. So we need to be careful about, I don't need to be continuous at the endpoints. I only need to be left continuous and right continuous, depending on what endpoint I'm looking at. So we got, our interval looks like this, a, b. So all the interior points, we need to be continuous. And then we also have to be one-sided continuous at the boundary points right here. So we think about A. So at A, we need to be, what do we call that? Right continuous, pretty sure. So if we're on the left side, so we're on the left side, we'll be right continuous. And F is left at B. How do you think of the difference between the epsilon and its uh, So you're going to have a delta neighborhood, basically. 
and your delta neighborhood is going to be one-sided. So instead of talking about a delta neighborhood ar around A like that, your delta neighborhood is one-sided. So it's basically just that right there. So you're not going to be on the left side of A, just on the right side of A. So it's a little confusing because we're right continuous at the left endpoint. So here's the way you want to think about that. Think about the actual, if you're at the x value a, what side are you continuous on? Think about that. You'd have to be continuous going to the, I need to point the, going to the right. What should be going? going to the right. Everything's backwards for me, so I'm going to point the wrong way. But if you're at A, it only makes sense to look to the right. And so you need to be right continuous at the left endpoint. And if you're at B, what direction does it make sense to look for continuity? Certainly not outside your interval. It makes sense to look inside your interval. So you want to be continuous that direction. So it's always pointing into the interval your continuity. So it's a little tricky. A is a left endpoint, you need right continuity. B is a right endpoint, you need left continuity. Yep. It would take infinitely long to prove something is continuous? Sure. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so what we're going to do is basically look at a graph and say, hey, look, there's no holes in it. That's basically how we're going to do it. Uh, and the reason that we're focused on specifically left and right endpoints and left and right continuity is because many intervals are not open. Many uh, domains are not open on both sides. So there's like the square root function, for example, goes from including zero to infinity. Um, and I can draw a square root function out very easily. And actually, what we're going to do is develop rules for continuity rules that will follow right out of the limit rules. So if we look at so really quick example. So domain 0 to infinity. So just looking at the graph right here, there's no holes or jumps on the graph. So it's nice and uh, smooth, basically, right here. Smooth is not the best word. That means derivatives are nice. Uh, but you can draw it without picking up your pen. That's another way to think about it. And now what happens at 0? So if I zoom in. I am continuous if I go to the right. But it doesn't make sense to talk about going to the left. There's no to the left. Like this, there's nothing over here. So I can't go to the left. So I would be continuous f uh, on the closed interval 0, well, close to 0 to infinity. That would be continuous 0 to infinity. Remember, there's the domain ends over there. Okay. Like, there is no to the left of 0. Okay. As far as in this function. There are numbers over there, but this function is not going to use them. If I did, the output would be imaginary. Yeah. And then we'd be talking about complex analysis, which is a fun topic. But I think you probably only picked that up in grad school. So unless you're going to electrical engineering, you won't need complex analysis overall. All right, so that's a really fast example. So we do have the problem. If you actually wanted to prove continuity from what I showed you, your problem is there's an
infinite number of values, so it would take you infinitely long. So that's unreasonable. So let's look at the floor function. Most places I've seen this written, it looks like sort of like square brackets, except the top pieces are missing. So it kind of looks like an L and a backwards L. So this is the floor function. And it is defined to be the small, the smallest integer that is less than or equal to x. most numbers. Right. All right, so we'll graph it. What is the smallest integer less than or equal to zero? Zero. What's the smallest integer less than or equal to one? One. What's the smallest integer less than or equal to two? All right, very good. All right, let's think about one half now. So halfway between zero and one. What is the smallest integer less than or equal to one half? Is one less than or equal to one half? The oh, geez, the biggest. Wow. I was like the smallest would be anything. There is no smallest integer because no matter what, negative infinity would be the sort of right answer. Right. But there's no. Yeah, there is no smallest integer, so this should be the largest integer. Let's go to x. All right, you could sort of think of it like the blackjack function. So that's 21, but you don't want to bust. So 21 or less. If you're not a gambler, ignore that. All right, largest integer now. All right, so think about one half. What is the largest integer you can think of that is, so certainly it's not, there's no integer equal to one half. It's not an integer. So what's the next smallest integer going down? Zero. zero. So we're going to be zero here at one half. And I could pick any fraction between zero and one. And the largest integer that's less than that will be zero. So I'm going to be zero, not including up to one, but just up to one. So up to one, it's going to be zero. Now what about all the, maybe it's better to think about decimals over here. What about, for example, 1.1? 1, 1. 1. What's the smallest integer, le largest. largest integer, less than or equal to 1.1? 1. 1. 1. So we're basically rounding, right, we're, we're truncating down. We're not quite rounding down, we're truncating down. Like a stair function. Yep. So it's going to look like this right here. And then when do you stop having 1? You stop having 1 as soon as you actually have the value 2. Because that largest integer less than or equal to 2 is 2. And then once you go past 2, you still use the integer 2 until you hit 3. So it is basically a staircase function. We can do the same thing. It hurts the brain a little bit to think about negatives, but I think if you look at the pattern, it's pretty easy to draw the pattern. So we're just going to draw the pattern. So we're going to use negative 1, negative 1, and we're going to go up to 0. And then same thing for negative 2. So why does this hurt the brain? So negative one half, what's the largest integer less than or equal to negative one half? Negative one. Zero is bigger than negative one half. But the problem is negatives, when you think big or smaller, your intuition is pretty much out the door or a window. Because, for example, negative three is less than negative two. 
but three feels is bigger than two. So negatives make the brain hurt when you think about less than, greater than. So what we'll do just think about positive numbers and then just say, ah, I can see the pattern. It goes like this. So there's our fuller function. So if we were graphing this out, you'd recommend doing like zero and then one and then two and then just reversing it and doing it the opposite. Yeah, positive numbers are easy to think about way easier than negative, so just think about positive values and then look at the pattern and just move the pattern to the left. All right, that's the floor function. The ceiling function is similar, except it would be, uh, I think it's the smallest integer greater than or equal to. So the ceiling function is opposite. So where's, so if you get a vocabulary word you're not sure about, let's say you're doing your uh, web works and there's a ceiling function. Where's a good place to go for a definition? Textbook. textbook. So they got an index in your textbook. They may have ceiling function in there. Let's say ceiling function is not in your textbook. YouTube. YouTube's okay. So you can certainly go to Google, but almost always the first thing is going to be Wikipedia. And that's a really good, I strongly recommend use Wikipedia as a first resource if you see a definition you're not sure what it is. There, well, there's lots of resources to go to, but a, a good default is Wikipedia. Um, for all of our level math stuff, it should all be correct up there. And it's also nice because they have links to other things that are related. So for example, while you're looking at the ceiling function, there's probably a link to the floor function. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Is this something I said? All right, so let's think about when, what x values is this function continuous for? So not talking about left and right continuous, just regular continuous. So what points? What x values is this function continuous for? So let's start with an easy one. What about 1 half? Does the left limit match the right limit match the value? No problem. So 1 half, totally fine. I can move over a little bit, 3 quarters, totally fine. What is the largest value, or maybe a better question is, what x value is it not going to be continuous for if I keep going to the right? So two is a correct answer, but the first one I hit will be one. So what happens at one? Left limit doesn't match the right limit. So it's not going to be continuous there. Uh, so if I think about one half and go to the left, how far can I go before my function is not continuous? What happens at zero? Is this function continuous at zero? Does the left limit match the right limit at zero? No, it goes from negative one to one. So left limit, right limit, don't agree. So yes, it's going to be continuous on every interval that, on every x value that's not an integer. So we can go all non-integers. If you want to get really nerdy. I haven't talked about left and right continuous yet. We'll get to that. Okay. So if you want to write that out, you could say this says all real numbers. This sort of sideways equ uh, minus sign means except. All real numbers except integers. So all real numbers except the integers. All right, so we got continuous at all, basically all decimal numbers, all non-integers or continuous. What about, and then we did left continuous first, I think that was our first definition.
So we'll do right continuous first. So already I could say all non-integers uh, or all non-integers it's going to be right continuous for. Because if you're continuous, you're going to be right continuous. Continuous is a lot stronger. It means both sides, uh, you have the limit matching on both sides. So let's just write down the ones that is right continuous but not continuous. So let's think about the integers. We'll go for one first. So think about one. Ooh. So at one, at one, and delete that. Oh no. Are we right continuous at one? So if I look to the right, my x value is 1. If I look to the right, so if my x value is 1, my y value is also 1. So I'm right here. That's the point I'm looking at right now. Can I go to the right? Yes. No problem. So I'll be continuous at 1. What about 2? If I think about the point right there, 2, 2, can I go to the right and have continuity? Yes. Yep. So all points are right continuous, but no points are left continuous in this function. Yeah, so actually all points are right continuous. A probably better way to say it is all integers are right continuous. Also, so I'll just write all integers are right continuous. So we can just write that as z. Now it's also true if you're continuous, you're also right continuous. So I can include all the numbers from the first part. Yes, yeah, we're going next. So we'll look for left continuity next. So if you want to have some fun set notation, all the integers, union, the real numbers, minus the integers, is all the real numbers. You don't need to worry about that, though. That's some fun set notation. Algebra. So let's just ask the question, is f of x left continuous at, at the integers. So the easiest integer is probably 0 or 1. I think we started by looking at 1. So let's look at 1 now. All right, our x value is 1. So we're up here again at that point. What happens if I go to the left? I fall off, so that's not continuous. You'd be falling off, so that's not continuous right there. And of course, same thing happens at 2, I'd fall off. 0, I'd fall off, so it will not be left continuous at any integers, because you're going to fall off. So if you're asking for what function could I define that's sort of ugly, uh, you can define functions to be certain values on like rational numbers and other values on irrational numbers and then the graph looks like uh, points. That's where you start getting to more like real analysis where functions get very ugly. So we will do, let's see, so this is a good place to end for today.